get ready to profit in three, two, one. Hey squad, we're back in the studio. Ben here and I've got Blake. Hey there. And Ray. Hello, hello. With me and we've got an exciting topic for you, especially if you're a brand, you're in-house, your client side. This one is for you. So Blake, what are we going to cover today? Today we're talking about the five reasons why digital agencies fail their clients. Wow, what a great topic. I think so. Uh, it seems like there are definitely patterns <laughs> that we've seen over our careers. Blake, while working at an agency, have you ever had a client leave or fire you? Uh, no. no. Blake has it. <laughs> Not once. <laughs> of course, of course. I've had a, a, a partnership has fallen through or a, a client has left. It's kind of the nature of, of the game a little bit, but... Um, there are specific patterns or things that we've seen in the past and why clients leave that I think will be, well, you know, we'll talk about in a little bit. And I think it'll be really interesting. Yeah, Ray, how about yourself? Yeah, same. I mean, there's a bunch of different reasons on why a relationship may fall through, but hoping that the topics we cover today will kind of shed some, shed some light and deliver some value. Kind of a, an icebreaker question to kick it off then. You know, we're from our perspective, right, we're approaching this from the agency side. So the uh, kind of the other side of the table from a lot of our listeners. Um, what would be, from our perspective, you know, a normal churn rate per year, right, or kind of an average or maybe a goal? Like your agency side, you've got a book of clients you're working with. Um, any thoughts on percentage-wise what you guys have seen for an annual churn rate? Ooh, yeah, I mean, that's a pretty tough one. I mean, it probably depends on, like, what exactly your service is. Like, if you're doing, like, you know, like, we offer a PPC and SEO. I'm sure it probably varies by, like, if you do web or, or what have you. Um, I mean, maybe 5 to 10%. I mean, it's, it's going to vary, uh, obviously, but I would say churn rate in that area. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, you're right, too. It probably varies between... Are you primarily project work, primarily retainer work? Right. Yeah, and the nature of your engagement and also the size, right? Because <laughs> if you have two clients and one leaves, you have a 50% churn rate. That's, <laughs> right. that's going to be pretty rough. The worst. You know, but I think if you're looking at, you know, a, a more matured agency that's established uh, and, and from a retainer basis, the, the number that popped in my mind, Ray, was something like, you know, 10%. And yeah. if, if more than that, you know, number kind of leaves, you probably have to start taking a hard look at, you know, are you um, attracting the right partnerships? But, you know, I, I want to quickly kind of define what we mean by fail. Um, Blake kind of alluded to this, right? We're talking about how do agencies fail their clients, you know, and what are some of the common reasons that clients or brands would leave their digital agency? So, we, <laughs> you know, we've all got experience, I think, uh, in in various of, of these pillars, these pillar areas. Um, there are some that we're not going to cover today. There are some obvious ones, I think, like performance, right? If after a, a given amount of time, uh, there's, you know, been non-performance, that's a pretty obvious reason why, you know, a client would, would part ways. So we're going to try to dig into some of the the trickier ones that are often under the surface and, and sometimes don't even get communicated about um, as that relationship is unfolding. So Ray, let's let's dive into the first one. Yeah, I mean, the biggest, in my opinion, is probably trust. And like, that's probably one of the biggest pillars that we're going to talk about today. If you like Ben said earlier, if in any relationship, if you don't have trust, it's not going to work, especially if there's a lack of follow through. And that that's going to be one of the biggest damaging factors. So being able to say what you're going to do and then actually following through on that is going to be paramount in ensuring that you start to build that trust. And a lot of the time you, you haven't worked with this um, person before. So being able to start the engagement off in a good way is going to be really important. Yeah. So this is one that you're right. It's important from first contact in the sales cycle all the way through, through that handoff and every single day when the team is showing up and, and delivering for that client, um, you can either be engaging in trust building or you can be eroding trust. Blake, how do agencies fail their clients when it comes to trust? 
there really are a, like a, a whole host of different things, but I think it comes down to maybe three main factors. Um, the first is communication and having a good foundation and a good partnership with whom they, they can communicate regularly and um, have quick response times and get back to them with um, detailed information, right? And then going into that further, I think it also goes to transparency specifically is a really big one. Um, a lot of agencies will kind of uh, hide behind the numbers. Um, they'll kind of build a narrative that do is, doesn't tell the, tr the true story of what's going on, um, and they can kind of try to maybe trick their clients. I've seen some um, scary examples of that in the past where it's like, okay, we're, well, you know, you're not telling the full story here. Um, so that can be uh, problematic. And then the last is basically accountability when you're not really taking ownership of what you're responsible for and the KPIs you're supposed to hit. I think those are kind of maybe the three main factors that go into trust and building that trust. Um, and each one is just extremely important. Yeah. To me, I think about, <laughs> this isn't the philosophy <laughs> podcast, but <laughs> I think about what is the essence of trust, you know, kind of in this definition and, it's truth. It seems like it's truth. Telling the truth, which is something very basic and fundamental, um, but I think it can get overlooked. I mean, to your point, Blake, in some cases we build a narrative, whether, uh, you know, that could be intentional or unintentional, right? I've seen cases of both, right? Um, that may not represent the full truth, so maybe mm -hmm. it's, you know, an error of omission or probably less frequently of of commission. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but so first it's, you know, telling the truth, even when it's hard, even when, you know, it represents a lack of, of performance or diligence, you know, on the agency side. Right. Um, or uh, even if you, if you want to invert that, right. Think about like not telling the truth to the client about a hard reality that you're seeing in their numbers uh, or in, you know, Hey, we've tried this strategy, this approach, it's not working. We need to change, you know, or some, it's hard, right? When, when people have beliefs that they cling to on either side yeah. of the table uh, and they cling to them strongly and, and you get data back that suggests that's maybe not the truth. Mm -hmm. It can be hard, yep. you know, depending on the, the dynamics um, to bring that up. And so you want to facilitate an environment that allows for those truths to come to the surface on both sides of the table. Uh, and so that you can move forward together in a productive manner. Um, yeah. And like to add on to that quickly, Ben, like a key trap that I got caught in early in my career is saying yes a lot of the times to things. <laughs> and I think like on the trust building side, like being able to say no for something that you believe in, there's data to back it up, you've had experience from that standpoint. I think being able to say no and back that up um, is a key building uh, for, for like building that trust in, in a relationship. And if you don't have that trust, it's it's likely not going to work out long term. Yeah, I'll add to that. And I think what I've learned over my past experience is the, the clients you stick around and you start to develop that relationship with, like you on the other end, if, if you're listening to this, you want your partnership to say, hey, no, this isn't working. Like we need to pivot, right? You want to have those hard conversations because really what happens on the other side of that is you come out so much stronger and now you position yourself in a much better place overall. So um, clients who do that are going to provide way more value because they're willing to kind of stick their net neck out there for what is the truth and what needs to be talked about and what needs to be addressed ultimately. Yeah. And that's such a good point. And so, right. It's like, can we create that environment of safety together where, you know, you could say on either side of the table, hey, we were wrong about this, and here's what we want to do instead, you know, being mm -hmm. solution-oriented. And, Ray, like you said earlier, um, going back to telling the truth and, and trust building, it's making commitments and following through, you know, and I think there's always a tension on our side, or at least this is how I, I view it as, you know, being a servant of the client, you know, and being... <laughs> just being a, a high level operator in client service, you know, and you want to constantly go faster, deliver yep. more value and, and do all the things. Um, however, you're doing everyone a disservice if you overcommit and under deliver. And especially so when maybe you're making commitments to things that aren't 
align to the end game incentives that we all care the most about. So like from a prioritization perspective, mm-hmm. uh, we'll get into that in one of the next, uh, one of the next pillars here. Um, any, any other thoughts on this idea of trust building accountability and so on? I mean, what about, is there a, is there an accountability component here in the inverse? Like you can think of, right? Hey, agency accountability, Hey, you said you're going to build this campaign by this time. You didn't do it, or it was not done to the agreed upon level, or you know, etc. Like, what about the inverse? Yeah, I'll, I'll. From my perspective, what I've seen in the past is clients and, and like marketing managers and, and, and the other side of the relationship, where it kind of crumbles and fails is oftentimes when they don't have someone accountable for communication on their end. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's a group uh, or like of three or a group of 10, you know, like w- there's a huge team on their side um, and no one's really the champion of communication to get back to the agency. Um, and f- there can be huge pitfalls where, you know, hey, I've sent three emails over the last month. No one's gotten back to me. And then we hear this, we hear, you know, we might hear feedback like, where's the communication? It's like, well, we don't know who to even reach out to. Um, so on your side, if you're working with an agency, maybe you have a large team, but I think ultimately what you need to do is put somebody on your team in charge of communication, communicating with the agency. It's going to help you in the long run. It'll also help make for a more like efficient relationship with that agency. Yeah. And we'll talk about expectation setting later, but that's going to be a big one, like setting those expectations early on in the relationship. Mm-hmm. How often can we communicate? Who's the key point of contact at this engagement? Like that's going to be so big in ensuring that this relationship does not fail and why, you know, we fail as an agency. So that's, that, that'll be a big one. Yeah. That's, that's so cool. It's like, let's lift up the rug and get really clear and really direct. And maybe it's a little uncomfortable, but let's talk about expectations. Let's talk about uh, accountability and roles and, and all of these things in, in the spirit of just aligning together to produce great work Mm -hmm. and great outcomes. Yeah. That's really cool. I'm a little sad that nobody said trust falls as an exercise because I thought that was going to be big, but it's, I know you're a big trust fall guy. (laughs) I am (laughs) truly. So what about uh, the next pillar? We want to talk about being proactive. And this is one I feel like in the last year or two, it's probably just subjective experience. But, you know, the folks I've talked to, um, you know, especially some that have chosen to come and work with us, they've they've mentioned this, this lack of their current agency partner being proactive. They feel like it's gotten stale. Um, and they're looking for a driver from the agency side of the table to kind of help them lead strategy and push them, you know. And so I get the sense that, you know, there's almost a desire for some healthy friction or some healthy, um, you know, challenging in, in this bucket. What have you guys seen or heard or observed when it comes to you know, agencies failing to be proactive for clients. Yeah, I think a lot of times what happens is the agency just gets kind of caught up in the numbers. And what they do eventually is they report or they deliver what's there, but they're not explaining why or how or what they're going to do about it, essentially, right? Like, you know, maybe traffic is up 10%, revenue is up 15%, and that's great. But it's like, okay, well, why did this happen? You know, let's peel back, like, what's working? What can we um, build upon? What can we try next? You know what I mean? And so I think um, agencies mm-hmm. kind of just get complacent a little bit, truthfully. Um, and then it kind of goes back to the communication and taking accountability and realizing like part of, as an agency, part of our responsibility is not just to report on the numbers and just um, sort of be there to help manage that, right? It's also about um, figuring out what's next and bringing that to the table. And a lot of times, um, and I, and I've seen this I- as well, but um, and it's good that clients themselves will bring ideas to the table. That's always really, really helpful. But when it gets to be too one-sided, that becomes an issue. Yeah. And like to add on to that, from my perspective, I feel, you know, one of the biggest reasons why a client wants to hire an agency is for them to be led. And if you're not bringing that strategy to the table and you're not responsible for executing and the client is, it's just going to cause like, that, that's a big reason why, why it'll fail. Um, there's a big difference in my mind from like consulting a client on strategy versus like waiting for like 
<laughs> the client to like tell you what to do. So like if you're being proactive and bringing those strategic ideas to the table and you're saying, I think we should do X because of Y, it's big difference versus like, hey client, what do you think we should do? Like that's not a, a recipe for success. That That's going to end in failure every time. Yeah. Right, that's not a good way to frame uh, a suggestion or an opportunity, right? It's not taking that leader frame in presenting it. Um, this one is so interesting to me because I put myself in the, the client's shoes here, so in the shoes of a lot of our listeners, right? And I think about what's most attractive uh, when it comes to hiring an agency. Like, what are the reasons that I'm thinking in my head you know, that I would really want an agency uh, to team up with. And, I'm, you know, when it comes to being proactive, I'm thinking about reasons like because they've got experience across a number of clients, so they're seeing different patterns, different trends. Uh, I'm thinking about based on their specialization and the disciplines they work in, you know, in this example for ourselves, like paid traffic and SEO. Oh, because they're getting a lot of reps in those disciplines. Mm -hmm. They're on top of those industry changes in that um, they're bringing value from that perspective. So, uh, you know, I think thinking through that and how that would maybe inform the expectations I would have of the agency and being proactive, yeah, I would want them to be taking a growth mindset, sort of a not complacent mindset and to also surface to me those instances where they're seeing wins for other clients or they're seeing emerging trends or opportunities with technology or in yep. just in the industry generally. And that's kind of how I'm thinking about from that lens, what proactive could look like. Um, you know, how I think how it can break down too is if an agency has developed a process or a procedure and if there's no innovation in their DNA, if there's no process on top of the process to help them evolve the process, or um, I, some agencies have gone this route of actually having a role focused on strategy, a role focused on growth for the book of clients that can sit sometimes atop or sometimes adjacent to the subject matter mm -hmm. expertise groups of client service folks on the agency side to sort of be that driving force. So you sort of have like a, a growth contingent and also like a man maintain contingent, you know, where there's like optimization and efficiency, but then you're looking, you know, you have someone whose role it is to actually look at what are the moonshots that we could make for this client, you know, that could 10 X our conversion rate or our, you know, total revenue yep. or whatever. It kind of goes off of the idea, like if I see something working really well on paid search or if Blake sees something working well on like organic, it's surfacing that to the client. And even though we're not responsible for email potentially or like another channel, they can take those key insights and then take that into their strategy for another channel to help, you know, elevate all ships. So like that's, you know, a big opportunity. Ooh, I didn't even think of this, Ray, but it, it definitely factors in. It's like if the agency side doesn't have enough client specific knowledge or knowledge of the client's customer, it's gonna be really hard to be proactive. In other words, if they're siloed and only thinking about their particular craft or discipline, like, you know, the agency that's in charge of our email, right? And so they're gonna just bring email, email, email things to the client. But to make themselves look better potentially. Potentially, right? Or it's just like not even intentionally, but it's just kind of the default response based on their experience and the way they operate in their box. But like, again, thinking about where's the value, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like going to that higher level place and saying, look, I'm seeing something work well in this discipline. And I know that organic search is one piece of that customer journey, you know, for our client's customer, right? Um, oh, but how would this inform, Ray, like the paid strategy? How would this inform uh, the content we want to put into that email? Yeah. Or, you know, how could we change our overall acquisition mix based on what we're seeing here? You know, or how would, how would that inform budgeting, for instance? So having that, that bigger picture and, and almost reframing it, you know, this is from the agency side, your client's client. You want to think yeah. in their terms to really be proactive and really inform your strategy. 
Yeah. And in my experience, being able to speak to that <laughs> level and not only to your channel just makes you so much more valuable as a partner in most instances, because then you're not only thinking about your discipline, you're thinking about like the business as a whole and how you can help um, uh, uh, other channels. Yeah. All right, Blake, we're going to move on to the next pillar. And we're going to talk about misaligned incentives. Blake, how much do you love when someone asks you to rank them on page one? for a keyword they care about. He'll do it. Yeah, just uh, send me an email. <laughs> He'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> no, I mean, this is such a big one because um, what happens is in the, in the sales process, a lot of times th there's really two, two ways that this can happen. Like this can be a problem, misaligned incentives. Um, the salesperson either, one, um, sells something that like the service team can't really do or can't really deliver on or can only deliver half on. For, for example, right? Uh, and then that breaks down when the service team starts working with the client and we get there and like, oh, well, this isn't really the right fit. Like this was kind of doomed from the start. And that's a, a bummer for everybody because, um, you know, at, like as the service person, like the account manager or the person doing the work, I can't really do much at that point. I could just try my best, <laughs> sort of. Um, and and that, that one hurts. And then people get really disappointed. But the other one, though, is the... The, the, the handoff between the salesperson and the service team because that is such an important moment in the like life cycle of sales to like getting you know boots on the ground getting work done um, if the service team isn't aware of your goals and you maybe you, maybe the client has already explained them to the sales team but they haven't been transferred and key information is missed and uh, maybe the service team doesn't understand like oh we're prioritizing this part of our business and this other part of our business just isn't as important um, and we don't have that information, it, it can be a, like a huge pitfall and it just, c things can get back uh, or things can be, get off to a bad start essentially. Um, that one's uh, not quite as big of a bummer cause I think you can rectify it and you can move things in the right direction. Um, but it, that one hurts as well. And, um, it, it, those are, in my opinion, probably the two biggest results of essentially of misaligned incentives and not understanding the true expectations and goals that the client is trying to, to, to reach. Hmm. That's, yeah, those are excellent points. When I think of this, you know, I'm thinking of it almost from the economic standpoint mm -hmm. because incentives are powerful drivers of behavior, you know, across like all domains of life, effectively, you know, habits and uh, relationships and uh, just everything, right? So I'm thinking about like agency fee structures, that's mm -hmm. one that I've mm -hmm. obsessed on for just a long time. And, you know, like, for instance, you know, one of the classic PPC agency fee structures is a percentage of spend. There's a lot of debate on it. It's easy. You know, how much did you spend last month? We're going to charge you 10% of it or whatever. And great. You know, here's your bill. The problem is that Brands, clients, every business, right, has a business to run. They have uh, an economic, financial reality. Uh, and so if you, Stephen, cubby this thing and you begin with the end in mind, and from, like, Blake, you were talking about kind of that sales-to-service handoff process. If you begin from the very first conversation, you know, with a prospective client, um, or with an agency guys that are listening, um, and you frame that discussion in economic terms in terms of the business outcomes you're looking to drive, the things that you care about, uh, you know, marketing director, CFO, CEO, like the, the, the business level outcomes that the sort of executive leadership team cares most about driving, and you frame your marketing engagement mm -hmm. on those terms things are going to go a lot better for you, yeah. you know? And again, there will be some, when the due diligence is being done and sort of the research, the projections, the, you know, the, the benchmarks are being set uh, and the, the growth forecasts are being run. Um, sometimes you run into situations where, you know, I'm, I'm thinking here guys, instead of an, an agency, uh, like percentage of spend model for PPC. I'm thinking about like a performance based or an affiliate based agreement, right? Like a dollars per lead or a, you know, percent of revenue or percent of profit kind of engagement. Yep. Um, 
sometimes you run the numbers and you find that it's not going to work in the current situation. Either the, the margins are too thin, there's not enough cash, there's not enough scale, the payback period's too long, or uh, most commonly, what I've been seeing is that um, there's insufficient or inaccurate data that prevents that kind of model from being deployed. But in general, the, the further down the funnel you can sort of get to that business level outcome, you can when you're working with an agency and comping on that and aligning on that, that KPI as well from a measurement standpoint, um, that's going to go a lot farther. I mean, Ray, what do you see in this area? I mean, how much of a difference does it make optimizing for gross profit instead of clicks to the website or something like yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're obviously if you're optimizing for CAC or profit or, or what have you, you're actually making more business-related outcomes versus just driving as much volume as possible. So you're, you're actually making, you're delivering business results versus just like vanity metrics. And not saying that vanity metrics aren't important, like, you know, clicks and impressions and all that good kind of stuff. But if you're able to optimize towards profit, for example, you can go back to that CFO or whoever your main contact is and say, here's how hard your marketing or PPC or what have you is working for you and actually have a you know bottom line story to tell versus we got you 10,000 clicks last month, yay, versus we delivered $10,000 worth of profit. Like it's a big difference in the way the conversation is being had. 1,000% and one tip I'll throw out there is if you're on the client side currently, you're working with an agency, you're, you're even measuring on something like a uh, cost per acquisition or you're measuring on something like a return on ad spend, a ROAS, right? Sometimes those numbers are stuffed and they can, and or they can lie or not tell the whole story, again, intentionally or not, right? There might not be enough data that the agency has access to, to to really report on what's actually happening. But there are many, many, many scenarios I have seen where a positive ROI is being reported on the agency side but when you back out things like uh, leads to qualified leads, to close rate, to lifetime value, or on the e-com side, gross margins and uh, average order value and repeat purchase. Like when you go all the way through the funnel and, and build the model based on what's really happening in those cohorts that are being acquired from paid traffic, you can do it for other channels too, um, suddenly a 5X ROAS is you're actually losing money. Every dollar oh. you put into Google ads, you're losing a dollar fifty, And that's a sad day because that's kind of, uh, it's hard to, to track down in many cases. Um, but it's one of those hard realities. So yeah. it right. sounds like if you build trust in the relationship early on, you can have those types of conversations that are actually leading to business objectives. Perhaps. And, you know, I think again, beginning with the end in mind is, is critical. So, what about mismatched expectations? I mean, <laughs> I've seen this one before. Sometimes I think we could get overconfident right on the agency side. Um, what have you guys seen? Client comes in, big expectations, big, big goals. When does an agency fail a client when it comes to expectations setting and, and kind of aligning on expectations? Yeah, I mean, we, we've kind of hinted at this throughout a bunch of our conversations. It kind of, in my mind, goes with those um, misaligned uh, ex incentives. So if you're not rowing in the same direction, if you don't have the same goals of, as the client and you're not setting those expectations, one, are they reasonable? Uh, that, that, that's a big one. Um, <clears throat> so ensuring that they're reasonable, but also, like, how much time is it going to take you to get this result? So, you know, back to Blake's example, and I'm sure Blake will speak to it. If, if a client wants to rank page one on Google and they want to do it tomorrow, Blake, is that is that realistic? Is that going to happen? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing not. If you email me. Oh, no, yeah, of course exactly. not. No, it's not. <laughs> but Blake, what about chat GPT? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, you got to go back to the first episode to get that one. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, like, time, money, like, how big of an impact you're looking to make, like, these are all really big conversations to have because on, on the flip side of it, too, Ben, kind of going back to the agency fee side, if you're paying a low agency fee and you're, you know, you're, you're asking for a lot, you have to really set those expectations with the client or with the agency to say like, here's what I, here's what I want to get. And then it's our job to say that is realistic or it's not realistic and to have those conversations. And again, it goes back to building that trust early on because if you don't have that trust, um, 
it's not going to work out. Right. Either the conversation won't be had or what? Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be sad. Yeah. And I'll just add to this. You, you just touched on it, Ray, but if you're going down the route where you're pursuing like an SEO agency, you have to have a long-term outlook on this, right? It's not like we, we're joking around. Can you get the eight page one tomorrow? Um, I mean, you maybe if you you're the, the 11th position today, right? <laughs> like maybe. Um, but if you're not on the map and you're looking at this, a key, a specific keyword, like a head term and you say, let's, let's get there tomorrow. Well, it's not, it's not realistic. It's not possible. Um, it's take, it's going to take time. And likely it's probably going to take two to three months at the, at the like, quickest. Um, so those expectations and those, like, boundary settings on the agency side are really important because a lot of times clients come in and say, you know, we want the world, of course. Like, that does happen. Um, but they're like, well, how long is this going to take? That's such a big question that, you know, I get all the time. And the truth of the answer is it's probably going to take three months, and it might take six months. Um, for SEO specifically, you're talking about SEO and the timeline um, for going from not on the map at all to page one. Like, it's going it, to, you're going to need to take some time um, some, some hard work is going to have to be done to, mm -hmm. to reach that. And I think it's just so important to actually like set those expectations and be really clear about, um, you know, what you're looking at. And again, having that long-term outlook. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. And I think it also, sorry, but I think it also allows you to like build that trust and be <coughs> proactive early on, because like, if you're clearly setting those expectations, you can be proactive and say, in 60 days, here's what we're going to accomplish. Here are the milestones. Here's what success looks like. And then you can build, build, build versus being like, here's what we saw over the last 30 days and, and not being, you know, you're being reactive versus proactive. So again, all this builds on each other. And by setting clear expectations, it allows you to be proactive. Once you clearly execute your plan, you're building that trust. So everything just kind of like continues to build on itself. Yeah, positive feedback loop when you have the trust and you set the boundaries and you set clear expectations. For this one for me, guys, I sometimes when I talk to clients or prospects, I'll ask them, what do you have more of, time or money? <laughs> right, because Blake, even to your, your point, right, it's, um, it's somewhat of a, not arbitrary, but you, know, you gave a guideline. You're like, hey, it's going to take some months realistically because in, in most of these marketing channels we're talking about, they're fully matured. The competition levels are extremely mm -hmm. high. You know, obviously there's some variance like in paid with, you know, cost per clicks and, uh, you know, saturation of the SERP with competition and auctions and stuff. And in SEO, like, okay, sometimes you get lucky. It's pretty rare, right? Because everyone has all the same data generally now, <laughs> right. uh, you know, in terms of like keyword research and stuff. Like on occasion, you'll, you'll find a gem and you'll be able to exploit it and stand up an article or something that can rank more quickly. But in general, you know, the prospect of ranking uh, for a matured search result in a competitive keyword space or topic space, it's like, it's, it's like, how can I build the best possible resource for users and stand it up here, you know, and get data and make improvements and iterate on it over some period of time so that I can go from zero to on the radar, you know, and that's, that's a huge undertaking. And then thinking about, well, that's one, that's one article, you know, or one service page, for instance, now do that at scale for <laughs> your right. whole site. You know, it's, it's a huge undertaking. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and ditto on the, you know, on the paid side, there are, there are cases, there are scenarios I've found where it's, it's more prudent to take a slow conservative approach and, and go for a really high ROAS or, you know, a really low cost to acquire a qualified lead situation and allow, you know, and, and then kind of build on that, take like an iterative approach where, you know, okay, great. You know, month one, you're like, you're like 10% to your goal. And then month two, you're like 25%. And then also, you know, it kind of compounds when you, it's like a land and expand approach. Yeah. Um, and there are cases where, hey, we've got cash flow. Hey, we're spending a lot today on paid. Um, we don't have a lot of time. Maybe we're running hot. You know, we're, we're break even or we're actually losing money on a lot of our acquisition efforts on Facebook ads or something. In these cases, it's like, all right, we got to go. We got to go now and we got to make a big change. So I think that's key. And I, the other, the other thing I want to point out with mismatched expectations is, um, you know, it's great when a client comes to an agency and they've got a clear idea of what they want to achieve. You know, there's always talk of smart goals. Hey, hey, agency, we'd love to achieve this return on ad spend in 90 days across these channels. Great. Sounds cool. 
you know, or hey, we want to grow our organic revenue by 20% this year. Well, fantastic. But this is where that, again, that trust comes in um, and that, that data, that reality piece. Is it realistic, right? Mm -hmm. What's your history of growth? Are you going to resource this initiative uh, to the extent that it needs to be to achieve those? Or, um, Ray, we're seeing this in the, in the travel tourism activity space, right? So many market specific variations in search demand and yeah. search volume. Yeah. So, so client, great. You want to grow 20% search demand for your market or your activity is down 50% year over year. Uh oh, That's going to be brutal, right? You're going to have to be the best and, and pretty much, uh, no stone unturned to achieve that kind of result. So got to set those expectations. You got to do it. You want to align them too and come to an agreement. Um, the next one, guys, the next pillar, lack of expertise. Oh, no. <laughs> Ray, what are your thoughts? How do agencies fail clients when it comes to lack of expertise? For me, it's kind of like um, like shotgun approach versus like being surgical. So if you've got somebody who is, you know, managing your paid, managing SEO, doing local, doing email, doing everything, they're... In my experience, there's nobody that good who can do like everything unless they just have like a bunch of like time that they're working on. So in my experience, it's better to have someone who is working on specific facets of the business based on like how, how large you are. So having that generalist versus specialist in my experience ha has been like huge. So again, somebody focusing specifically on paid, somebody on SEO, dev, like all that kind of stuff in my experience has been really big. Um, Another key thing that I've seen as well is if you have this rock star person who's working, so back to my first example, they're doing everything, and they happen to leave that agency, uh-oh, like a, a bomb just went off there. Like, like there's <laughs> going to be a big issue um, from that standpoint. So, like, in that realm, those are probably, like, you know, two of the biggest factors that, that I've seen. Blake, I don't know what you've seen on your side. Yeah, on the, on the organic side of things, uh, we've talked about this actually like off air yeah. uh, a few times, but what happens is like uh, one of the main reasons that an agency will fail really is because an SEO team or agency or whatever, they don't really have a true process mm -hmm. and um, they give clients to like basically a, a really green SEO analyst, right? Who doesn't really know their way. They don't have the experience to like, put out fires when they, when they, when they arise, or they don't have the experience to come up with new ideas and really like push the boundaries and um, ex execute work uh, because they're just new to it. Right. But what happens is essentially your service as, as the client, as the company who is working with this agency, your service is as good as that like analyst that, and then, and, and, and that's full stop, right? You're, they're only as good as an analyst because that's who you're working with and that's who you're, who's doing your work. Um, so the, the problem there is basically agencies will like to l oftentimes use like cheap labor interns or Fiverr freelancers type, you know what I mean? To try yeah. to like execute um, and things will just break down because it's not quality work and you're not getting a true expert's opinion or input or uh, feedback it, it throughout the, that process. And um, it's a huge problem, I think, just like globally in the SEO industry where a lot of the times the way it works is you are getting cheap labor and it's unfortunate um and there's ways to kind of identify that but it's yeah it's kind of a pitfall of, of a lot of times what, what people are working with SEO agencies you want to know something weird i've thought about in the past guys is like should our industry have an apprentice program <laughs> almost like you <laughs> see in the trades like seriously not like star wars i mean I, i'd love to like give that <laughs> sort of like <laughs> you know kind of vibe to it but you know what I mean? Like, oh, like you're a journeyman electrician. Like, should you be like an apprentice SEO and like have more structured ways to come up in the craft? Because I, I just feel like the way, you know, it's kind of like the Wild West though, right? Like very little regulation, very little structure, like people just make it up. And, and just to get kind of weird for a second, like if you zoom out 30,000 foot view and you strip away like, hey, we're agency partners or the people listening mm -hmm. are oh, mar marketing VP or something, you know, client side, like, like strip all that away, the client's incentive at a base level is always to extract maximum value from agency per dollar, right? And the, the agency's incentive is always to extract uh, maximum value from per employee, you know, mm -hmm. like from an economic standpoint and like the way that most of these 
if you think about how an agency financially works, if you think about how most businesses financially run, right, it, it, that's kind of like the reality in a weird way, <laughs> if you think about it. So, so those are at odds, clearly, right? It's like, it's like just market dynamics, like buyers and sellers, right? It's supply and demand. And so um, it's like agency grows, um, agency hires, you know, more junior talent or entry level folks and, you know, aspires to train them up in the craft and so on and so forth. But then some of the dynamics, Blake, that you pointed out tend to happen in Ray, obviously it happens on the paid side as well, clearly. Um, that's what I wonder is like, should there be more clarity? Should there be more formalized structure to it where you could say, oh, you know, these are the expectations for a journeyman or an expert or a grandmaster SEO. You know what I mean? That's kind of an interesting concept. Grandmaster SEO. <laughs> right. I mean, I like I, that. When do I get that badge? Dude, it's like a triple black belt. <laughs> <laughs> I Truthfully, I think that's a really great idea. Um, we should look into it. All right, squad. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, my last point on that is the turnover of the point person. So because individuals vary in their capability, um, in their knowledge, their client specific knowledge, their domain knowledge, et cetera, you know, just 80, 20 rule period. Um, perhaps at the start of an engagement, you had the best person in that discipline on the agency side assigned to your account. And 18 months later, they get assigned to a new account or they leave or whatever, and you get a new person. And, and I've also run into this just countless, mm -hmm. a dozen or more times over my career, right? Like, Hey, why, you know, why'd you give us a call? Oh, we're working with agency. We had an awesome person we were working with. They left. The new person, we barely hear from them. We don't know what they're doing. Why did this have to happen? This is terrible. You know, it's, <laughs> okay, all right, I got you. Um, but again, a case where you want to sort of have that transparency, that trust, who are you working with? Who's your point person? Yep. And have that long-term perspective as well. Um, Ray, last pillar. I mean, I guess this is sort of a bonus pillar, lack of process. Tell Plus me more one, about that. Bonus, <laughs> bonus yeah. chapter. Bonus, <laughs> bonus. The hidden, the hidden pillar. Um, Blake, you hit on this earlier, but like that lack of process or that lack of handoff can make an engagement start off in a really bad like foot. And Blake, you said like we can maybe recover from that, but if your first engagement with a new agency starts off and you are promised all the stuff in the sales process. Oh, I'm going to get you a Forex row as Blake said, he's going to get me to page one on Google and all those great stuff's going to happen. And then all of a sudden you're handed off to the ops team and none of that is communicated. Um, the expectations run realistic. You, the client said, yes, they're all excited to get started. And then it's just like, man, when you first start, it's, it's, it, it's hard to recover from that. And that retention number that we talked about earlier it's, it's going to be hard to retain that client is the point I'm trying to make. So yeah. it's having that clear process early on, like you start off on sales and you're cle cleanly handed off to ops that, that makes the world of a difference. Yeah. That first impression matters so much, like first touch by the client service team. Right. And, and so that sales to ops handoff piece is huge as is within a given discipline. Like Blake, you hinted at this earlier, having a way, having a method, having a process, having clarity in like the actual work that will be done, yeah. you know, to, to achieve the desired result. Yeah. I think this like, again, I, this is a pitfall of the agency for sh the, like, agency life and the way that it works specifically on the SEO side. I don't know how much it, this impacts paid. I'm sure it does, but um, like having a documented process for how to do keyword research, how to develop a content brief, how to actually like, like tactically complete a, a, a task will make like a, that, a, that agency so much stronger because again, it, it comes down to less of the individual's capacity to do the work. If they're new, um, that might not be as strong of, of, of an analyst, but if they have a strong process to lean on, well, now we're not worrying so much about um, how good is this analyst? It's more about oh, how good is this process and it's worked and it's tried and true and we know that this works and if you do it and if you check every box and it's not a checklist. I don't want to make SEO sound like a checklist but if you check every box um, Sounds like a checklist. Yeah. So <laughs> easy. Just email me guys. Um, if, you, if you follow this really strong process that we've done in the past for five years and then we know it works because we've seen it over the years um, that work can be so much stronger and it's so important that if you're working mm -hmm. with an agency that they have these processes in place. Love it. Quick shout out to Atul Gawande with Checklist Manifesto. Great book on checklists, <laughs> if you're interested. 
Um, let's guys, let's move into some Q and A. Let's do it. So first question here, what are red flags when hiring an agency? So what advice would you give to a client, you know, maybe their agency shopping for the first time or they're looking for that next partner in some area? Mm -hmm. What are red flags that sort of signal, um, <laughs> pay more attention or possibly keep looking? For me, if it sounds too good to be true, it's it's probably too, too good to be true. And like not saying that, you know, <clears throat> guarantees are always a bad thing, but they're probably mostly like like a bad thing. So like if somebody's saying, <laughs> you know, again, back we make we make this joke the whole episode, but like if somebody's guaranteeing they're going to rank you a specific way, that's a red flag. Yeah. If someone's saying we are going to increase your ROAS by XYZ percentage in this amount of time frame, it can be a red flag. Now I, I've seen it work where it's like, hey, we'll we'll maintain your OAS or beat your OAS over like a longer time frame. But again, that's having the end in mind. So if you say something like over a six month period, um, we'll maintain your OAS or um, like something along, along those lines, that can be helpful. But in, in my mind, the biggest red flag is if it sounds too good to be true, like you might want to get like another opinion. Okay. So being bogus is what I'm hearing. Making bogus claims <laughs> being silly. without a case to really back it up. Yeah. Yeah. I think specifically if you're working with an agency, like th if you're, um, looking to hire an agency, I would want to hear our goal is to do X and this is how we're going to do it. Right. Instead of saying, we're going to do this. Trust us. Tr yeah, trust <laughs> us. But like, I would want, okay, here's what we want to achieve and here's how we're going to achieve it. Um, yeah. That's ultimately, I think if like what you need to hear on the, on the, like, the hiring side, like the, the perspective company looking for an agency side. Um, because, yeah, I was going to say specifically on the SU side, if anybody is making you guarantees, it's it's a huge red flag. And I, th I there's two things. So that one, to, if, if you're hearing guarantees from an SEO agency or an SEO specialist or whatever, tru truly run away. No, no uh, SEO analyst worth their weight in water will um, guarantee anything. It, you can't. There's so many variables. Outside it's, of your control. Out, yeah, there's just too much, right? But my it, cousin works for Google and knows how the algorithm works. Yeah. Dude, the people at Google don't really even know how <laughs> it works, so. <laughs> Coca-Cola recipe. Yeah. But the other thing, and I think this might honestly be controversial. This is, again, this is like a specific SEO agency type tip. Hot take. Yeah, hot take. Get ready. If, if the agency's plan is like more than half to build backlinks, and like they're really relying on backlinks. Oh, we're going to build 100 backlinks a month. And that's like the majority of their plan. I s personally see that as a red flag. There's going to be SEO analysts out there who will probably disagree with me. Um, but backlinks, and this is kind of getting more pragmatic and maybe even another episode, I don't know. Um, backlinks are becoming less important over time. They used to be extremely important and it's kind of dwindled in value. Um, so if their primary... Um, method for achieving the goals that they've set is through backlinks, I would personally consider that a red flag. So to recap, we've got bogus claims from Ray. We've got no roadmap, no proven process from Blake. For me, I'll throw in asking for budget before providing pricing. I'll call this one, I'll label it the used car <coughs> sales situation, right? The, uh, well, how much is this new SUV? Well, how much, how much do you have? That's about how much <laughs> it's going to cost, guys. <laughs> you know, one of those situations. Oh, so interesting. That's right. exactly how much this costs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, what a coincidence. You know, I think it goes back to that plan piece, right? Like if you're working with an agency, they've done this before, they have a strong sense of the, the roadmap and the plan that will get you from point A to point B, they, they have some sense of, you know, how many resources that will take to achieve, regardless of the format of their fee structure, right? Yeah. Hourly, project, retainer, percent of X, whatever. Um, the other one too is like not transparent or won't let you own the accounts uh, or won't tell you about the team that will be working with you mm -hmm. when you sign on, you know, if the, any of those happen and they seem reluctant or like they won't share some of that basic information that you'd expect from a, a quality long-term partner, I would say, keep looking. Head for the hills. <laughs> Head for the hills. Uh, head for page two. <laughs> so <laughs> next uh, next question, what are signs, you know, let's say a uh, client is working with agency currently, things are feeling stale, maybe they don't have great data or it's just kind of like that gut feel. You're like, eh, this thing is getting long in the tooth here. We better, we better start 
kicking the tires, looking elsewhere, you know, just seeing what's out there. Um, what are signs you should maybe get a second opinion? I think one of the big signs um, is if you, so you should be meeting with your agency probably at least monthly, but maybe biweekly, whatever the cadence is. If you're meeting with them and you feel like those meetings aren't valuable and they're be, like, maybe they were at the start and they're becoming less and less valuable and you're like, you end that meeting and you don't feel like you learned something or you're walking away with clear action items or, you know what I mean? It just doesn't feel valuable. You're like, oh, I just wasted 60 minutes of my day. That's a clear sign that you should probably start looking for a new agency um, and kind of trust your gut a little bit. And maybe, you know, if you, if you have a strong partnership with the agency or something, maybe you can say that, like, you know, these meetings aren't very valuable and I think, you know, something needs to change. Or if you're starting to feel like, okay, maybe they were selling me snake oil um, and this is a whole, a little bonkers, just, you know, baloney. Um, maybe it's time to just say, okay, let's, let's like start shopping around. Bonkers and baloney. Yeah. In the same. There was another B word that I was looking for <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> I decided not to use. Okay. <laughs> um, Ray. Yeah. I mean, I've got two. So if you've got someone managing your paid ads today, here's what you should do. Log into your platform, go to Google ads, Microsoft ads, Facebook, Facebook ads. ads. Go, go there. There's a change history feature for all of these platforms. Google how to do it. It's really straightforward. Select the change history and look how many changes have been made in your account over the last 14, 30, 60, 90 days. If there's not a lot of work being done in your accounts, that's like one of the like health metrics that we like to look at. If a lot of work isn't being done in your account and you're like, like what gives? Yeah, exactly. Like what the heck? Um, that's <laughs> one big thing you should look at. So that's like number one. The other one is like if you're flatlining in like in like your performance. So like if if performance has been the same, you're maintaining the same revenue numbers, you're maintaining the same ROAS numbers, um, and there's not a lot of conversations being had on like you know how to grow that number again. Like maybe your goal is to to maintain with with paid traffic, but like most businesses, they want to grow and they want a strategy on how to do that. If your numbers are flatlining, that might be another reason to get a second opinion. Yeah, that's so cool, Ray. I I'm so torn. Like change history is a great, um, a great sign, you know, of, of activity and value. It's like, I've heard this from prospects before. Like, I feel like I could fire the agency or they could stop managing my account. And in a month, nothing would be different. I'd have the right. same exact performance. And you're like, okay, that's probably a sign. But <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm torn because I'm, I feel like there are 80, 20 principle, right? There are certain changes you could make in an account that have an outsized impact. Yeah. However, on the, to invert that and, and very much what we're staking ourselves on is consistent action, consistent, small improvements make all the difference in the world. Yep. You know, 1% better every day is going to make a big difference over, you know, the lifetime of that account or, you know, over the time frame you're, you're working on them. Right. And having that dialed process and that consistent action is what will get the result. It can, it matters more to do that than to be the smartest SEO that ever walked the planet <laughs> or the best PPC. The Grandmaster yeah. SEO or what, right. what, what was that called? Grandmaster yeah, SEO? Yeah, Grandmaster. Nice. Triple, triple black, black belt. belt. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Maybe we'll have that as a badge in the squad. <laughs> <laughs> so those are some, some, signals that you should get a second opinion and start having some conversations. So overall, hope this was helpful. Squad, um, kind of takeaways, quick recap on the five plus reasons why digital agencies fail their clients. Uh, one was trust. Two was being proactive. Three is misaligned incentives. Four is mismatched expectations. Five is lack of expertise. And the bonus was lack of process. Bonus. We bonus. We gave you some red flags, some signs that you should start looking for a new partnership. I uh, hope this was really helpful and uh, shout at us with any questions. We're happy to have conversations with you guys anytime. Email Blake at 2100digital.com no. if you want to rank on page one on Google. No. So just email him. I'm your guy. <laughs> <laughs>